Welcome on in, everyone. How y'all doing? This is the 12th installment of Gold and Silver Spaces, by the way. So we're moving on up. Doing great. We had a uh, banger of a show last time. Goodness gracious. That was a uh, marathon of excellence. And uh, having Don on, he's like just the, uh, I don't know, he's just the best. <laughs> it's a hard guest to top, I think. Yeah, Don's great. Got a lot of good info out of that. Um, I know I'd like to get Jim up. Jim, if you're available, I'd like to hear uh, your insights. We had spoken earlier, and you thought you had some technical indications you'd like to talk about in gold and silver. If you're not ready, that's okay. We can always get to you later. Um, I actually want to bring up some points here today. I want to start off a bit more in the macro before we talk about gold and silver itself. I think we're starting to see some things uh, play out here. And uh, I learned a bit today um, that I'd like to share with you guys because I think it's uh, rather telling of where we are. I think this may be going over the, the heads of a lot of folks here. I mean, I, I myself have just, just sniffed this out. So uh, I'd like to get into that. looks like Jim's not coming up yet. Uh, Nostra, welcome on up, buddy. Uh, good to see you. Before I get started, I might go on a bit of a rant. Is there anything you'd like to kind of chime in with it first? Uh, not really. I just wanted to comment on, I'm sure everybody already saw the credit lease uh, situation and how dire it might be, uh, considering what, what will happen on Monday with the closed door Fed meeting also occurring. So yep. that's the yep. macro part. Yep. Yeah, uh, I've seen some uh, pretty interesting charts out there. Uh, credit default swaps up to 2008 levels. They're going parabolic. I mean, the, 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 the equity is tanking. I mean, it looks like uh, whatever's going on, whatever's expediting this meeting is obviously a big deal. I see people scoffing at it like it's no big deal. I mean, obviously something is going on. I don't know how big or small it might be, but obviously something's going on. I mean, you look at what's happening globally, look what happened that just got done uh, happening in uh, the UK. I mean, things are breaking, right? And we knew we'd get to this point. We've been having these spaces for 12, 13 weeks now <laughs> because we knew we were getting close to this. So while we started it, right, it's like a clarion call to get ready for all this crap. And here it is, it's coming. So, yeah, Credit Suisse, right? What if this is the first one, right? This, this may be uh, the first major domino with collateral damage, right, with contagion. This is a big deal, right? This might be better, bigger than uh, some of the banks uh, that went down first in 08. This is a big one, okay? So um, I think that the chess pieces are here. Look, I, I made a video today. I put out a video update today. And I spent probably 30 minutes talking about charts, and I probably should have spent 30 minutes talking about this stuff because I feel like we're here. And part of what I started off with, I was talking about how the Bank of Japan managed to move long-term interest rates on the United States by 3%, right, by selling only $21 billion in treasuries, okay? And that that's a testament to how tight things are okay or loose if you want to think about it, however it helps you understand but they have a 1.2 trillion dollars worth of treasuries left to sell and i want you to understand in case you don't that they have to sell these treasuries to get the cash that they need and it's it's multifaceted it's twofold first of all they have to prop up their bond market right because they're doing yield curve control right so that's one aspect of it the second is that you need dollars to buy energy and they're an in energy importing nation OK, so they're having to dump these treasuries to raise cash and the effect that they're having in and of themselves alone, just Japan is pretty significant. OK, you saw a three percent move in the TLT just because of Japan. So it begs the question, right? It really starts begging the question. How much do these nations have in treasuries around the world? And I've actually got the answer for you. And more important than the answer, because it should beg the question for you, right? Like, well, how long can they keep selling? I mean, <clears throat> they have, uh, they're selling, you know, 21 billion, but if they've got 1.2 trillion, this can go on for a long time, right? Well, here's what's interesting about it, all right? <clears throat> if you look in the Eurozone, let's just start with the UK, because we're all so familiar with the UK right now. They have 80 billion, all right? Now, if you uh, divide that by their burn rate, <clears throat> they only have two months worth of treasuries left. Two months. So think about what that means. What comes next if they run out of treasuries? It means they have to print money, right? Because they can't print oil and they can't print dollars. 
<laughs> so they have to print pounds to go buy dollars to go buy oil. And the only other option would be, and here's where things start getting interesting, is if they manage to facilitate the trade for energy in pounds, which would be a big deal. But we're going to get to that later on because I think this is all starting to tie together. So just to put this into perspective for you, here's some interesting information. Go ahead, Nost. Uh, did you say 80 billion of treasuries for the U.K.? Yes. Um, I'm looking at the four major holdings of treasuries since July 2022. I'm seeing 634.6 billion. Was there? Was there like an update? They... Can you share? Can you? Where? Where is that from? From the Treasury.gov website. You able to nest that? Uh, how do I do that? I actually don't know how to do that. This is for FX reserves? Uh, this is the major foreign holders of treasury securities. If you just Google um, uh, foreign holders of treasuries, uh, okay. it, it, you should pretty much get the uh, treasury.gov website. Uh, Jim also sent a message. He said it'll be up a little bit later, so he's uh, going to be coming in as a speaker soon. Yeah, something's uh, not right here. I've got uh, World Bank IMF uh, from Sid Verma from Bloomberg, um, eighty billion, uh, less than two months worth of import cover. Can uh, you, so we're can gonna you have... post that one up. So I can yeah, see. yeah. Well, uh, give me one second, uh, Alex. Can you feel the noise while I do this? Uh, sure. So uh, something I want to kind of talk about is, um, you know, a reaction to last week's episode. I mean, you just got the goods, like. Just all the, you know, the top gold stock picks, silver picks. So, I mean, um, they're all there. And, um, you know, it was just so great to listen to them. And, um, you know, they said, uh, or again, he's going to bring, um, or he invited Lawrence Lepard on again. I don't know if he knows it or not, but uh, he's, he's coming on again. So it was really awesome having those guys on there. And uh, I just felt like a fly on the wall listening to, uh, you know, what's really going on with a lot of these stocks and, um you know, it was just great. So, um, you know, I'm probably going to be buying a little bit more. And, um, you know, there's just there's great companies out there. And, um, you know, they're just they're right on the floor. It's the knife on the floor. Just all you have to do is reach down and pick it up. So Nostradamus, what, uh, do you buy stocks a lot or what do you have mainly? Uh, for, for mining stocks? Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, do you do mining stocks? you do physical? Or do you do, how are you, are you in gold? How are you in gold, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do it all. I have, um, I have a, you know, basket of uh, uh, the small ones, the, the Explorer Co's and the, uh, the Exploration Miners, the very few of the production ones. I have a lot of the major ones, your Newmonts, your Derricks, your Aniko Eagles. Um, I have physical, and uh, I also do a lot of auctions, so... That's probably the majority for uh, for how I do things in the in, in the sector. That's about everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what about yourself? What are you in? Um, mainly uh, stocks. So uh, I have some physical, not a whole lot. But uh, I'm kind of, um, you know, when I started, uh, I've kind of talked about this before, but when I started investing, uh, it was like around the peak of the silver 20, I don't know what it was, 2011 or 12 or whatever. So um you know, I caught the, a bit of that. I didn't have as much money, but, um, you know, I've just, I've been in ever since, you know, kind of watching. So, um, you know, I'm just always, I always have my eye on it and I'm ready for that, uh, that big bounce, that redemption. That's what I'm ready for. The redemption. Yeah. So you didn't get in until, um, 2011. Uh, what's, yeah, that's when I, to... that's when I first started, you know, kind of getting decent paychecks and whatnot. So. I see. Okay. That makes more sense. And you and yourself? Uh, I didn't, uh, I knew about it from before I had, um, I, cause I'd known about Peter Schiff from before where he was talking about it pre 08. Um, so I was, uh, I was in it just very tiny at the time. You know, I didn't have that much money to have a substantial holding. Uh, but overall I've, I've actually added the most in my life in, uh, 2018 which was around the bottom i was at 1200 for 
for uh, for gold and well, silver was the same price as it is now. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, uh, that's that's my story. Yeah, and and uh, silver, you know, I also do uh, uranium investing. Um, so there's a lot of overlap in those crowds. Um, but yeah, uh, I got into I got into uranium, the uran the uranium royalty um, trust two years ago in 2020. It it went up a lot. I actually sold out and haven't been back in. I'm not I'm not that big into uh, the other resources. I'm mainly uh, the gold and silver, some some copper. I like oil, but I'm not at all into uranium at the moment. Yeah, but silver right now is just um, it's it's just it has that uh, that opportunity to it. I mean, it's uh, they have to have it. The supplies being dwindled, you know, the supplies in the landfills, and um, it's you know, it's not going to take that much to go from you know, whatever it is now to you know, thirty or forty. Like that's it feels like that's just baked in the cake. So these companies are just just ripe for the picking. They're just sitting there waiting for you. That's my take on it liberty you back with us yeah i'm here i was just letting you guys go along and i was trying to uh double check this too to see what the misunderstanding is i mean i am seeing uh the same numbers that he is it's actually 634 is the number i'm finding as of uh, july i uh, know nope, yeah, here's september 30th here's september 30th from uh, st- us and it's 634 so uh, I'm Maybe not sure there was a mistake because Germany has 87 uh, billion in U.S. treasuries. Maybe there was a mistake where they were talking about Germany instead of the U.K. Maybe I'm pulling data together from a couple of different sources that I have, and one of them's Luke Groman, and he's got this table. Uh, I don't know if Luke would have made that mistake. Um, but let's forget the reserves number for a moment and go with the table and the data. Because he, what he does have is the total reserves in terms of months worth of imports, right? So to sustain uh, their imports with their foreign exchange reserves, okay? So uh, that puts uh, the UK at two months, all right? And it puts Austria at one month, Belgium at one month, the Netherlands at one month, the Eurozone uh, as a culmination together as an average is two months, France with three months, Germany with two months, Italy with four months. Uh, The only countries that have anything in the teens or 20s would be Russia, China, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Switzerland, which seems like a pretty big deal. Um, So it stands to reason that the these sanctions on Russia, right, are going to push these account balances to zero pretty quickly, right? So as you have the energy crisis, as energy is expensive, as the dollar is expensive, uh, these uh, reserves are going to be drained pretty quickly until the inevitable, which is when they have to print, okay? And if they don't print for dollars, then they have to at least purchase uh, this energy in their own native currency. And so that has a lot of implications of its own, right? So I think we're getting there in terms of time because, like I said, I just read off, you know, we're a month or two away from these these nations having to make a extraordinary decision, right, when they run out of reserves for these imports. So what's next? Well, did you guys see that tweet going around? This is something else I should have nested too. There's a tweet going around coming down from the top, Black Rock, Black Rock that uh, they're going to peg gold and gold mining as uh, anti-ESG. Did you guys see that? So the rumor mill is suggesting that there's about to be a major push on a negative narrative against gold that it, to position it as being uh, you know, dangerous to the climate and there's no need for the stuff anyway, right? It's just a rock. I don't know if that's true or not, but... If it is true, you could speculate as to why they might want to do something. And if you look at the situation that I just laid out for you here with the limited reserve that these nations have, right, to fund their deficits, all right, before they get to the end in this energy crisis, then what comes next? Well, Nord Stream was attacked, right? And regardless of who done it, it's been done. 
And so this is a game changer because it it guarantees in some ways what happens next in terms of energy, right? So Europe is going to have to make up for this somehow. So what happens when they run out of reserves? So is it possible <laughs> that they still negotiate with Russia uh, through their own native currency? And if not, then gold, because gold has been pushed by Russia and China lately as an alternative to all this. And Zoltan Pozar has said as much that this is kind of kind of, kind of be the backbone of the next system. So if you're Russia and your pipeline was just destroyed here, and let's say that we know for a fact it wasn't Russia, what might Russia do to get revenge? So a lot of people are immediately going to the nuke bomb, right? They're just going to go start nuking everybody. But what if it's a little bit more sophisticated than that? Financial weapon. Exactly. Now, how might they do that? So something us in the gold and silver spaces have talked about for a long time, for years, if not decades, is the manipulation between the physical market and the paper market. Well, if these countries were to start exchanging energy for native currency settled in gold, then you could potentially see – okay, think about it like this. If Russia – okay – uh, if you use physical gold to settle energy, okay, understanding that the uh, oil market alone is some like 15 times bigger than gold in annual physical production terms, okay? So then consider accelerating things by announcing a higher price of gold. So you might say that if you do deals with us, if you say, okay, I'm Russia, if you come sell your gold to me, I'll give you 50 barrels of oil. And, but if, you know, if you go buy from the United States, you'll only get 20. Okay. <laughs> so the free market would do the rest, right? Because the traders would arbitrage the trade. They would quickly crash the Western market, right? And the arbitrage. And it would break uh, the Western gold trade completely overnight. It would completely revalue gold. And all that Russia would have to do is find a couple of buyers in the West willing to do that. And it would happen almost instantaneously because the free market, like I said, would handle the arbitrage themselves. And that's a much more sophisticated way to hurt the West than going, you know, laying waste to cities and stuff, right? And so what if... What if, and this is all just kind of a big thought bubble experiment here, but what if that is the play? And what if the West knows it? And that's why they already are rumored to be setting up to go on this negative narrative campaign against gold because they know it's about to be a financial weapon. What are, your, what are y'all's thoughts on that? I think... Um... China is really the one that holds the financial nuclear weapon, so to speak, not so much as Russia, um, similar to uh, the Saudis. The Saudis also hold a financial nuke, so to speak, because they have the petrodollar. Without them, there is no petrodollar. When it comes to Russia, I think um, <clears throat> their main advantage is we saw, we saw the UN vote yesterday, and we saw China, Russia, India, Brazil, uh, uh, so they, they they refused to condemn um, Russia uh, the, for the referendums in Eastern Ukraine. So they're all on team. They're all on the same team, right? So uh, it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship. Everything Russia needs, China has, and everything China needs, Russia has. So they work together. And this is this is the part that's the most important is. Because China in the last 20 years has become the major trade partner for pretty much every country, which was once the United States, once they go off the dollar, once they, so to speak, de- detonate the nuclear, uh, the financial nuclear weapon, I think that's when it actually um, uh, starts playing out. Not so much, not so much as Russia, because Russia just has the uh, the oil, the gas the natural resources, which everybody does need. Um, But I just don't see Europe um, breaking from the U.S. and just trading with Russia without any sort of uh, catalyst. There will be a catalyst, and I believe Europe will capitulate and eventually remove all sanctions against Russia. But I don't know if they they will use their own local currency. That's the part 
that I'm not um, convinced on that they, they're going to use their own uh, so the euro or I guess if Italy leaves the euro uh, they'll use the, uh, their own currency I'm not sure about that Okay, so I, I kind of tried to set up, I tried to uh, bake everything into this cake already. So I think the catalyst will be, if we allude back to the charts, they run out of reserves to dump, to raise the resources for the energy that they need. Therefore, they are forced to print their native currency in order to go out and buy it, right? Because you can't just do like what Japan's doing and just dump treasuries if you're out of treasuries, right? So if you run out, and this is what these tables suggest, that they have one to two months left, then what do they do when they get to that point? At the bare minimum in the current system, in the current paradigm, they're going to have to print into oblivion to raise this money for their energy needs, right? And so that's its own catalyst in and of itself for a great many things, all of which are very bad for the globe, right? Inflationary pressures abound. But I think that that could be one of the catalysts. Once you get to the end of the road, where do you go? Do you, you know, do you keep forging forward with a, a machete, or do you turn around? And plus, I, go ahead. Right, I, I agree with you that they will eventually have to once the people with the pitchforks show up at their doorstep, so to speak. Right, they're going to have no choice. My my leaning is. Uh, I don't see the European countries. I mean, I see I see Japan doing it because uh, the J Japan's number one weakness is energy. They import; they're the second largest uh, natural gas importing country after China by far and large. Um, their trade uh, surplus has become a deficit for the first time in I, I probably ever. Uh, I'm not sure how far that uh, chart goes. Um, so eventually, they're going to have to capitulate, and it looks like they are. So you've had the uh, uh, <clears throat> the Japanese central bank for the first time since 1998 intervened in the FX uh, markets to prop up the yen. They've talked about uh, selling treasuries. They haven't yet. They've been using the dollar reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they seem to be ahead of the curve. They seem to try to nip it in the bud before it becomes too dire as opposed to what the Europeans are doing. So I think Japan will eventually uh, capitulate against Russia and I believe Japan is the only Western, quote unquote, Western nation that hasn't sanctioned Russia. I might be wrong about this, but I believe they're the only ones. And they had uh, re recent conflicts in the in the Kuril Islands with, with Russia. That kind of died down. Um, there was a, there's, they seem to be on better footing diplomatically with Russia as opposed to the rest of the Western camp. So I think they will most likely be the first western nation to uh to go along with russia that's that's right there. all right i actually think that uh, russia holds a little bit more power I, I i disagree with you on that i think russia is more important than china right now because of their natural resources and this is an energy crisis and you know without energy you cannot uh grow and you cannot sustain your GDP, no matter how much money you spend, right? It's like, what do you call it? The uh, red cream uh, syndrome, right? From Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> you have to run faster and faster and faster to stay in the same place. And so without that energy, that's where we are. And I think that's what makes, that gives Le uh, Russia all of that leverage right now. And if they start to wheel and deal outside of the dollar system, uh, especially uh, if they were to set it up truly, to go into gold, and this isn't some kind of gold, silver, wet dream. I mean, Russia themselves are talking about doing this. I mean, you could kind of see this playing out. And by the way, Comex weekly physical gold inventories uh, delivery has broken a 30-year range. It's the most in 30 years. It's a pretty big deal. So whoever wants gold's taking it uh, at a historic level. It does seem like things are changing, guys. It really does. This, this doesn't feel so conspiratorial as much as it may be kind of right in front of us. Um, maybe still a little bit blurry, but certainly I, th I feel like the information is is out here for us to touch in the field. Right, I I agree on the point that the natural resources that Russia has, you know, the oil, the gas, the fertilizer, the wheat, uh, everything they have is very very important. It's just uh, currently I see the, the the Chinese economic superiority as as the main. Uh, you know, the nuclear bomb, so to speak, or the financial nuclear bomb that they're holding against the U.S., where if they were to completely cut off the U.S. and sanctioning them and no more trade, well, 
while that would be terrible for China, I believe it would be much worse for the U.S. So it's kind of you hurt yourself to destroy your enemy kind of a thing. So uh, in that sense, I just think China holds a, a better position than, than, than Russia. But Russia is very important. Their natural resources in the long in the long term are very important. I 100% agree with you. I think they're in a, a better economic situation than China for the long term, like the next 50 years uh, or so. That part, I, I 100% agree with you on that part. Uh, if anybody else wants to come up and chime in about anything whatsoever, whether it's the equities, uh, the spot price, uh, the macro, anything you see, Russia, China, elsewhere, feel free to come on up and uh, contribute any way that you, you'd like to. The great thing about gold and silver is that uh, it's kind of all included because it all counts, even the politics. Uh, so feel free to uh, request to speak and we'll bring you on up. Uh, so it may be worth staying on, I guess, the near term. Uh, a bit more certain, I guess, and uh, like you had brought up on the intro, uh, Credit Suisse. So, uh, do you have any insights into that? Um, you know, have you been uh, digging around? Uh, I mean, uh, nothing more than we kind of all, already all knew, you know, going into this like months before, where a lot of these banks have, uh, you, you know, they're leveraged to the T to where the, all these derivatives are are underperforming. I mean, look at the Credit Suisse um, stock price. In the last, you know, 10, 20 years, while the U.S. financial situation improved greatly after 2008, Europe has pretty much just been terrible. And I think Credit Suisse, since Archicos blew up March 2021, since then, where they were one of the creditors who lost, I think it was $8 billion, something like that, um, uh, their stock and their credit default swaps are not, have not been doing so well since, since then. And it is all systemic, right? It's kind of like if one of the banks go, they all go because they all have, you know, the the relationships that intertwine. They have the counterparty risk. So the credit default swaps of, of one country, are, uh, one uh, bank are promised by another one, similar to 2008, where if you've seen the big short movie where uh, the, the main character, right, they had credit default swaps for the uh, mortgage-backed securities. That were, and the third party was Morgan Stanley. So if Morgan Stanley went bankrupt, even though they were correct and they had credit default swaps, they wouldn't have get they were they would have received nothing. They wouldn't get paid because their counterparty went bankrupt. So you have a similar situation uh, for the banks where they're all interrelated. So if one of them, like Credit Suisse, just just um, goes bankrupt, a lot of these other banks will also because a lot of their assets go to zero, and and they have all these liabilities and they're leveraged and you know. You know the whole story. Everybody knows. Yep, yep. Uh, good point. Thanks for bringing it up. Something else I was thinking about recently, actually, as related to that movie, is the whole issue with the uh, credit rating and how that didn't get changed, uh, though it clearly should have. I think we're already in a position like that, and you really have to wonder um, – who who should already be uh, in position that's that's kind of being kept kept back? Uh, but uh, I guess we'll move on. We're trying to actually make it a quicker space tonight. Uh, try to save the weekend, the Saturday night. So I guess we'll move right on into the metals themselves. Um, uh, looking at the quarterly chart, I think that the metals look quite good. I know Jim wanted to speak to this on a technical basis. Uh, so when he gets in here, we'll let him do that. But. Uh, gold managed to uh, keep and hold, at least for now, a 20-year trend. Uh, so that's kind of encouraging to see. Uh, obviously, the metals themselves, excuse me, the equities themselves were up this week 20%, so quite good as well. Um, I think in the near term, everybody's kind of kind of on the edge of their seat waiting for Monday. Next week does feel rather precarious in the markets. Um, you know, you got this uh, expedited Fed meeting. You have Credit Suisse and a whole host of – even this this Bank of England deal isn't done. There's still, there's still fallout from that still. There's a lot of people who got caught with their pants down, and uh, we don't know who exactly, but uh, somebody has lost hundreds of billions of dollars, and uh, that still has to play out as well. And so there's still more to come. You know, it just, it, we're here. Um, I'm kind of interested in hearing your guys. Oh, here we go. Here's Jim. Jim, what was the uh, technical basis that you wanted to talk about today, sir? Welcome in. Hi, good evening, Liberty. Um, Alex, um, I just had uh, one thought that uh, one kind of tool that I use, and that is if, if you can see a futures contract on something you're watching, that's what I watch. 
uh, on the chart, on the daily chart, if you can see a futures contract print on the daily chart where it takes out the previous three days range, either upside or downside, the whole range. And uh, if you look at a December silver, December gold, they both did that the, this last Friday's close. It kind of gives me a positive indicator. I've also, um, I'm kind of on record saying that, uh, look to me, I think I said at the last week of uh, August, that it looked like we were getting set up to make a low. And uh, silver made a low September 1st. Gold, uh, on the other side of the coin, gold made a series of lows through the month of September. And uh, it looks to me with this uh, set up on Friday that, that I'm mentioning now, that the if you can get a daily close that takes out the previous three days range, upside or downside, kind of gives me a timing indicator. So maybe we're getting there. Um, one other fundamental that I just wanted to bring up, and that is on Twitter, some of the uh, folks that I follow, they're talking about tightness coming back into the silver market where maybe even the premiums are starting to grow again a little bit. Constitutional silver, you know, pre-1964 and other forms, other coins, that kind of thing. So if the uh, premiums are increasing a little bit, I think that that's a, you know, a direct correlation with demand coming back in on the physical side. So that looks good to me. Yeah, I actually picked up some more uh, physical this week. I just picked up another kilo of silver because I found a pretty good deal. It was on a hero bullion. It's $2. It's $2 premium, which is great right now in this market, you know. So I went ahead and picked some up. Uh, I shared the uh, the link to it if you guys want to check out my feed and, and get some for yourself. But it's an excellent deal for decent decent quantity of silver. Um, but uh, the premium, again, is cheap. It's the cheapest out there. I think it's only about 10%, so which is quite good. Uh, but if you look at the broad markets, if you look at the charts, we're clearly rolling over. If you look at bellwethers like Apple, John Deere, Granger, they're all resting on critical support levels right now. Apple's resting at 138.20. This is the key level for Apple. And uh, everything in confluence around the markets are doing the same thing. And in the case of gold and silver, you're kind of coming up to some need, uh, immediate resistance. Everything else is kind of hitting support. So it's pretty clear if you look at the culmination of the charts that uh, we're at a, you know, kind of a catalyst, a wait and see event and so the market's pretty anxious here it wants to see what happens next but uh, uh in in silver if i can just add uh liberty if people will watch twenty dollars twenty one dollars and then twenty three dollars in the very short run if we start taking any of those out twenty twenty one and then twenty three basis december you'll be able to watch december silver now until the end of november so that might be a key for folks to watch yes sir i agree and, uh, you know, I'll, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I have a lot of confidence right now. Uh, I feel like the uh, the miners, even after their 20 percent up move, are still very asymmetric um, in the opportunity because I don't always think about things in terms of price on the Y axis. I also think about it in terms of time on the X axis. Right. Because time is time is crucial. Time is key. And I don't think that without some kind of major systemic liquidity event where everything on the screen is red, that you know, gold and silver really have any reason to go back down. I mean, the macro is breaking down. Fiat, fiat sovereign debt crises are playing out. They're only going to get worse. This is only the beginning. And I feel like all the signs are there. All you have to do is open your eyes to see it. And so I, I feel like this is one of those. It's really unfortunate because things are pretty bad and they're going to get probably worse. And um, it, and so it's hard to take joy in it on one hand. But then again, this is exactly why you buy insurance. So you don't have to worry about all the negativity. Right. You can you can live with a peace of mind. And I think that's kind of where we are here in the markets in gold and silver. I think that uh, you can feel good about owning this insurance because it's likely to pay off quite well. <laughs> pretty, uh, it's it's pretty obvious. I mean, clearly the Fed cannot continue to raise rates, and if they do, they will have no choice but to do what the Bank of England did and uh, do some kind of um, some easing, right? They'll have to do QE or something else alongside of it. But certainly, uh, they can't do what they're doing the way they're doing it any longer. Uh, or even they uh, will uh, be in some serious trouble for themselves. So it stands to reason to me that they are out of rope and we're coming to a pivot point here. 
And to reiterate, I don't think that a pivot is positive. I think a pivot is quite bad for the markets because a pivot indicates that the bank itself has capitulated, <laughs> right? They have given up to market forces greater than them, and they are no longer allowed to pursue the road that they were on that they said that they would not leave. Okay, so this is a concession by the bank. This is a bad thing, and it implies that inflation is here to stay. They have ducked out of the fight. They now have to turn the fight to something else, like saving banks or whatever it is the hell that they're going to do, print money into whatever fashion they need to print it. But I think that that's what's coming. Go ahead. No. Uh, hey, Liberty, I just wanted to mention your mic keeps distorting. It's been doing it the entire time. I, I don't know why that is. but Ah, uh, that's unfortunate. I'm just on speakerphone here. I don't know. God bless it. Uh, but anyhow, um, um, it sounds decent. I think it, I think it's it's going all right. It might be sometimes it's the connection too, but it it seems okay on mine. Okay. Well, in any case, I think we're obviously at the cusp of this. Um, you know, this is how things go. This is how things go. It's you know slowly and then suddenly. All right. And so we can expect things to start ramping up here faster over time. And so uh, this is why I have so much confidence and to go on the record in public and say as much, you know, and, and put my feet to the fire that these are the positions that I'm taking and the reasons behind them. And I'm going to stand behind them. You know, when I'm talking about my own book, uh, this is what I'm doing. And, um, you know, I feel like we are here. And uh, once this trade is over, we'll look for the next one. But I feel like this is an extraordinary opportunity in the precious metals. And you got the central uh, bank digital currencies uh, being removed. Look, I don't really care what the headlines are anymore. It's all bad. <laughs> it's like, what What good news is coming? Go ahead, Philip. Um, hi. Uh, sorry, this is my first time uh, listening uh, to you. And uh, the title, actually, of the space caught my eye. Um, can uh, I'm really, I'm not a big investor or anything like that. I just, I'm trying to learn, trying to protect myself. So, can you explain to me the significance of running out of this foreign currency reserve and what would, what would be the downside for any of those governments to um, print more money? We did it here in the U.S., right? And I guess it seems like, you know, it did not destroy the country yet. But <laughs> um, can you help me understand that? I appreciate that. Absolutely. You came to the right place. I'm actually glad you're here, buddy. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, if they run out of reserves, we're primarily speaking to the reserve of United States treasuries or bonds, right? Uh, these are U.S. holdings. So, essentially, think of it as cash. If they run out of dollars, okay, and this is important because uh, the way the world system is set up, think of the petrodollar. Are you familiar with the petrodollar system? So, in, yeah. if the nation wants to buy oil, Right? right. They need first to buy dollars because you must buy and sell oil in and out of dollars. Well, if they run out of dollars uh, to buy this oil with, then they must go buy the dollars. So this is what we were talking about. If the UK, for example, were to run out of treasury, treasuries to easily convert into dollars, they would have to buy the dollars with their own local currency. OK. And since they are already in a sovereign debt crisis and they are already printing money as stimulus to solve, quote unquote, uh, their energy crisis, they obviously don't have the money to do it. So they will have to print the money. And when you print money, when you are already 120, 130% debt to GDP, this is a problem because these central banks are beginning to raise interest rates now. So think in the case of the United States, you're right. This has gone on for a long time. This debt problem has gone along a long time. But the reason why you're starting to feel the pain now is that first we came into this energy crisis. So uh, there is a direct correlation to GDP with how many barrels of oil the nation uses. OK, so the more oil you consume, the more output you have. There go the higher your GDP is. Well, since we now have an energy shortage, we have no capacity to grow. Therefore, the banks cannot grow their way out of all of the debt that they have amassed over all these years and years and decades, okay? And so they are now being choked out by one particular issue, okay? So, and on top of that, they're now raising interest rates. So to stay in America, you have 30, $31 trillion in debt. OK, well, so for every one percent that you go up in interest rates, you have to pay three hundred and ten billion dollars in interest payments. 
That's interest payments on debt, okay? Interest payments. That's not principal. That's not, uh, you know, Social Security or anything else. That's just interest on the debt. Now, to put that into perspective for you, uh, in 2021, the U.S. government had $3.6 trillion in tax receipts, okay? This year in 2022, they're expected to have $4.2 trillion in tax receipts. So they're moving on up, right? That, that's a gain of $600 billion. Well, the difference is that now we have 3% and threatening to go higher interest rates. So that's $930 billion in interest payments. And so that 600, that net 600 billion gain has now been wiped out <laughs> by 900 in interest payments. So you actually effectively have fewer receipts this year than you did the prior, despite bringing in more, right? Because you, now you have uh, more liabilities. So this is what happens is that the interest payments on the debt eat up so much of the tax receipts that you have nothing left uh, to fund the government, whether for whatever, building roads or whatever, right? The government has no extra money because it, the debt is eating into too much of it, right? So uh, this is the problem is that all of these nations around the world all have too much debt. I mean, the, the Japan has what? Over 260% debt to GDP. You've got Greece over 200, Sudan over 200, Italy's 160. I mean, you go just around the block, Canada's over 100. And we in the United States uh, were up as high as 131, I think, or 135. And we have come back down about 125. And um, so, and by the way, historically speaking, once a nation gets over 125% debt to GDP, that's it. No, no nation survives that. It's only a matter of time before they collapse, historically speaking. So, and typically they only have a few years on average before they default on the debt. All right. Go ahead. Liberty. Go ahead, Phila. Um, so if I understand you correctly, um, uh, I think maybe in the U.S. because we own, you know, we we are the owners of the dollar. We'll probably be less at risk than, let's say, Italy or um, uh, Germany with the eighty billion or eighty-three billion um, in reserves at this time. But what would uh, again? I mean, it sounds like there could be. Uh, an ap uh, apocalypse coming, right? I mean, it seems like uh, these countries would have to survive somehow. They have to print their own money, and if and if they do, they are further in debt. What, I mean, are we talking about you know the strongest survive here in this case? I mean, would they the U.S. would have to go get their money from them, or would they have to invade somebody else to get their money? I mean, I, I mean, like it sounds like a very scary situation here. Yeah, you're right. It is a scary situation. And the problem is, well, first we'll address your first point, which was what, you know, the dollar, the United States stands to be a little bit stronger than the rest. And for a while, that is true, because the dollar has the has the benefit that no other currency has, which is being the world reserve currency, right? And so there are global debts denominated in dollars. You have to have dollars to buy energy, things we've talked about already. So this this creates a natural demand for dollars all around the world, okay? This is – if you want to know a bit more about what I'm about to say, hop on YouTube, look up Brent Johnson, okay? It's called the dollar milkshake theory. So what it is is when you have uh, all of this liquidity all around the world from all of this money printing, right, that's now generating all of this inflation – um, you have the dollar. Think about the dollar as the straw that's sucking it all up. Okay, the dollar sucking up all that liquidity into itself. It's growing ever greater. The problem with that is that the strong dollar is bad for the world, right? Because it takes more of your local currency to go buy that dollar, which means you get less of whatever it is you wanted. In addition to the higher interest rates now making the the cost to buy the dollars um, uh, more expensive as well, right? So. This this limits output productivity for everyone else, and it makes it harder for us to uh, to get the goods. And it's harder for us, too, because, look, 
uh, you think of the dollars being so strong, but that's only relative to those other countries. The dollar is actually getting quite weak, as you may have experienced in your day to day life when you go to the grocery store. Right. There's inflation everywhere. Everything is more expensive. And so it's not like the dollar is actually winning. The dollar is losing just like everybody else. It's just losing less. Right. And so the analogy that often gets used is that it's the prettiest horse in the glue factory or it's the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry basket. You know, it's still destined to be made glue. It's still, you know, a dirty shirt, but it's the best one of the bunch. And this paradigm will last for a while. And there's a couple of ways that it could go. It could sustain long enough to force the world to come to a Plaza Accord 2.0. Okay, so if you're unfamiliar with the Plaza Accord, um, long story short, the world had to come together and say, look, the dollar's too strong. The world's going, you know, we can't make trade. The dollar's too powerful. Let's all agree in accord to manipulate the dollar down lower to get this back into balance. And that's what they did. And so that's one way it could possibly go. Uh, the other way it could go is that, you know, the dollar is not going to escape its own velocity, right? The, 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 the Fed's not going to escape its own problems. And so when they start printing money, just like the Bank of England did to bail out its pensions funds, which, by the way, was only $2 trillion, the United States pension problem is $9 trillion, <laughs> right? It's much bigger. All of the problems we have are actually bigger than everyone else's, right? Despite some of the benefits that we have here, our problems are actually quite egregious. So it's not like we're going to get out of this thing. Um, it stands to reason to me, and you know, people can disagree with this, but I actually think that the that the Federal Reserve, along with the U.S. government, recognize this global fiat debt crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, and have actually weaponized the dollar to uh, bring about the collapse uh, at their own whim. Okay, they're bringing things down like a controlled demolition because, in their mind, I think that they think that they can leverage in a way uh, to get control on the other side. Uh, because if you know that this is inevitable and you have all the all the best cards in your hand, then why not try to play them and, uh, you know, try to get all the chips? Um, even if that's not the case, uh, they really don't have any good options if the Fed continues to raise rates. I mean, everything that's breaking is going to bring, uh, you know, it's going to break a lot faster, a lot harder and for a lot longer duration. You're talking about you may go into a severe depression that could last 10, 20 years, especially when you don't have energy to grow out of such a situation. And when you already have low capital expenditures into these areas like copper, oil. Right. So this is years and years, even more still before you can even try to get caught up. And on top of that, not only do you have a deficit in investment in to oil, but now you're raising interest rates, which means it's going to be even harder to raise the money to get into that investment, right? And so we are making the problems worse and worse and worse by raising interest rates, okay? Uh, lower interest rates actually lower the cost of a lot of goods. But here's the deal. It's like they're caught between a rock and a hard place because, you know, the narrative is that they're trying to stop inflation, but they actually never had the power to stop inflation, and nothing they're doing is actually going to stop inflation, especially because these politicians are simply going to print money. Think about COVID. Think about when everyone was, quote, unquote, suffering because they were forced to lose their jobs or whatever the situation happened. And these politicians rode out on their white horses and saved everyone, and they voted, you know, 98, 99 percent of the vote. In the Senate, you know, to all pass it in unison. These people can't wait to help you out, right? And they're not going to let you suffer, especially when they have the power to, quote, unquote, save you. So we know the response to this from the political side is going to be to spend money. That's what these politicians do. And part of the reason why we know this is because everything we're experiencing right now has happened in history, right? Empires have fallen in the past, right? Nations have collapsed in the past and that under similar circumstances. And they all go out the same way, right? By trying to kick the can down the road, by trying to help their constituents, by trying to be, you know, nobody wants to be in power when the pitchforks come out. <laughs> and so when you're in a situation that you can't get out of and there's no good answer, you're going to do whatever you can to try to delay the inevitable until you're either dead and gone or you're out of power. And so it's for that reason that you can expect uh, more inflation as they print money to save our own pension system or to bail out banks or whatever it might be. Um, checks in the mail, UBI, God knows what they're planning to do with this uh, central bank digital currency, but it opens the door for them to do a lot of these kinds of things without a lot of hassle, right? And so I, I know I just kind of rambled on a lot there. I hope it's not too much. Feel free to follow up. And Fila, what, okay. were, uh, 
what we're trying to do, Fila, is figure out a way what we can, where we can put our dollars that may be soon decreasing in value into something that will be worth more dollars. You know, a trade, if you will. Yeah. We trade dollars for something that might go up in value as the price of the dollar comes down. The dollar went from 95 to about 114 recently here, and uh, it's trading up about 112 now. The dollar is 112 on the dollar index. So if you can maybe invest or trade some of your funds for something, uh, uh, gold has come down from 2070. Uh, It closed on Friday at 1668, basis of December futures. Silver recent high was uh, $27 this year. And the silver got down to $17 and change, and it closed at $19.01 on Friday, basis December. So that's what we're trying to do in this uh, room uh, with uh, listeners uh, that are, uh, you know, adding their ideas, maybe their experience, and maybe an idea of a trade or two, something where we can take a decreasing asset that might be a U.S. dollar from 114 to 112 maybe back down someday to 95 or 98, something like that. If that happens, things priced in dollars, commodities might rebound a little bit. And uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do tonight. Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll keep listening. Hopefully I can learn something because, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm I'm retired, so I'm trying to protect myself. And this is like, it sounds like there is a big... um, big problem coming Uh, i mean i you know i'm old enough to to see prices of things go up we've seen in you know in the past 50 years i've been here like everything will go up and people eventually adapt to it i have never seen anything go down in price never once it goes up you know a dollar you're not gonna you know i don't care what the interest rate is it never goes back to where it was I mean, we all know that. So, uh, but uh, thank you, uh, Liberty. Thank you, Jim, uh, for the summer questions. I'll step down. Thanks. Yep, and that's the trick, right? Because um, not all assets are equal. And so uh, in an environment of rising interest rates, uh, you could expect some assets to be hurt quite greatly, like real estate for a pretty good example, right? And it becomes more and more unaffordable and people get priced out and eventually it has to roll over. And there are a lot of signs of that. I actually think that this uh, housing uh, market's going to be worse uh, than 2008. Uh, a lot of people uh, try to try to make the argument with me that, you know, This isn't 2008. It's not the same. And I agree it's not. I think that this is actually worse because states like Texas that might have been insulated uh, from this are not going to be uh, compared to 2008. I mean, this is impacting everyone uh, across the board. I don't think anyone necessarily makes it out of this. Uh, And so when you're looking for where to put your money and to keep it safe, um, historical reference and, uh, you know, historical analogs. Uh, I'll point to gold and silver as being the place where everybody goes in time of safety. And uh, it's not just a recession we're looking at. It's not just inflation. We've experienced those things before as a singular nation and as a globe. Uh, This time is a bit different um, because, again, uh, whatever problems we have, all of the other nations have, too. And that makes this really unique. Right. It's global. It's a global sovereign debt crisis. It's we have global food crisis that's still developing. You're going to see that more next year. Uh, Energy crisis. Right. I mean, it's all building up into a singular massive event, which is going to unfold, um, you know, suddenly and then all at once. And I think we're seeing kind of the beginning steps of that. And I think gold and silver um, make um, for excellent choices as a way to protect if not grow your wealth during this time and uh, something that i do as a technician is i get in the charts and i look for confluence i look for historical analogs i I believe i have found extraordinary levels of just these things and already so far they are playing out quite well Um, i think that uh, history is setting up uh, uniquely especially to 2015 and what the metals did during that time frame after a long uh, bear market and the reaction they got uh, there in 2015. I think we will see something similar here. Uh, that's the best uh, all around analog that I've been able to find so far. But uh, they are there, and uh, they're you know they're singing in harmony here. I believe that the picture being painted quite clearly 
And uh, that's that's the method I'm choosing. And look, I love energy. I love oil and gas. I think that those are great investments too. All right. Um, just look at what w- Warren Buffett's doing. <laughs> right? He's putting all of his money in the in the energy. And uh, you know, when people ask him, uh, well, why this? Why this? Why oil? You know, he and Charlie Munger just argue with each other about who knows less about oil. Right? <laughs> it's like they don't need to know how it comes out of the ground or how it does all these things to know, right? All the all the levels of it in the barrel, right? Like they don't need to know all of that stuff to know that we need it, and we're going to need a lot more of it, right? This is kind of common sense, right? Uh, especially again on the historical analogs of the way politicians have responded to these events in the past. They're going to print, and so inflation is not only here to stay; it's going to get worse it will go to the double digits um i think that's pretty self-evident now if i'm wrong the alternative will be a uh, massive depression so you know <laughs> i'm you know it's one of these two ways right which paul but i mean every politician like ben bernanke you know he's not in, in there anymore but you know he wrote books about like hey we did anything but a depression we just have to drop money out of helicopters so i mean we're not at those levels yet but i mean goodness it's it's uh, death of it feels like death of a thousand cuts. Like, hey, let's have student loan forgiveness. Let's have, you know, uh, more stimulus, more stimulus. Like, and what's the consequence of it? Consequence of it is, you know, savers. Someone that, you know, the average person is not speculating. They are, you know, they're on either a fixed income or, you know, they. It's tough. It's it's gonna be really tough for the average person. You know, again, we're speaking from you know an American perspective. But, um, you know, who gave these people the right to, you know, take away, you know, 6% of someone's life every year or whatever percent it is? Yeah, it's tough. And, um, you know, the longer this goes on, uh, the more upset people are going to get. And so, you know, what outcome, what solution will the politicians choose? And they'll take the path of least resistance. It's the logical answer. It's Occam's razor. Remember, the sword of Damocles hangs over their heads, okay? And so they understand the consequences of a pissed-off masses all wielding pitchforks, all right? And so, look, eh, I don't like, uh, what's it called, Hobson's Choice, right? It's one or the other. I, I think I don't – I'm not the guy to accept one or two options, right? It's, I tend to sniff my own way out. But this really is one of those situations where it's one or the other, <laughs> Right. There really are no other options. So um, and something else I like to say uh, is that, you know, you really need to get your head wrapped around the severity of the situation. It's not because, you know, you're going to need to put on your Mad Max gear or anything like that. But you need to understand that life is going to change. Right. You got to get over your normalcy bias of uh, what you expect on a day to day uh, you know, course of, of your of your life, because it's probably going to change in some way or another. Either way, we are likely headed into a meaningful enough recession to see uh, plenty of layoffs. OK, and this is something you can think about if you work in a layoff sensitive area. Right. You can start getting ahead of this now and considering this rather than, you know, standing there with your jaw on the floor once the obvious ends up playing out. So there are lots of things that we can do. It's not just what you go buy. It's just not what you invest in. There are day to day life choices that you can make to prepare for this stuff. Right. You're right. And especially the mental intellectual understanding of what is happening so that when it does happen, you are calm, cool and collected to deal with it like a rational adult. All of these things are equally important. And so, uh, you know, these are kind of uh, things that I would encourage everyone to consider and just say, you know what, it's about to get bad, but I know it's going to get bad. So let's just deal with it. Right. Let's just deal with it. Uh, If anybody wants to come up and uh, make any comments, uh, questions, doesn't matter anything at all. Go ahead. Okay, I got a question. Uh, did you change any of your portfolio from uh, the last uh, spaces, or did you buy and sell any more, or add any yet? Yeah, so I bought uh, I bought uh, AG. I bought more uh, Silver Tiger. I bought more Monero, and uh, I bought something else too. Uh, maybe it was Hecla. Um, yeah, I made a few purchases uh, Friday and Monday. Yep. No, I'm 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 serious about what I'm talking about. I, I've been buying, yeah, absolutely. This is this is, and look, we're up twenty percent already this week. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a little frustrated because Sand, Sandstorm is down so much, and oh well, there's a news release, but it's like, well, what happened? I want to hear, like, I want to have Don back on. What happened? What happened to me? Goodness, I mean, it seems like they're just, you know, uh, I don't know. Some of these places, they're just get they're printing too many 
shares, lifestyle company, whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah, that that one's really killing me. But um, you know, again, it'll go up over time. But it's just like, goodness, what's going on there? That's unfortunate. I didn't even know that or see that. I just looked at the chart, and that's killer. That's uh, three big weeks of downside. Um, looking at close to all time record volume. It's the second and third most volume on these two recent down weeks. So that's pretty, that's pretty unfortunate, man. It broke key resistance there, or excuse me, key support at 533. So that's, that's uh, unfortunate, man. I, I'm curious too. I mean, this was um, pretty well accepted all around as one of the best ones to play. So, yeah, I mean, again, you know, no names needed, but you know, some of the best of the best that's on their charts and, that's one of their best recommendations so you know sometimes even the best get it wrong and again i'm not like bankrupt or anything from it but uh, it's just uh feels like a bummer because you're like well i thought this was supposed to be you know one of the golden children or whatever so um, i'm a little bummed or frustrated you could say about that one understandably so i lost big on stupid gatos you know, I lost 60 percent on that one because um, they only had half the resource that they indicated. But this goes back to what uh, Lawrence Lepard talked about. Right. Kind of spread your your picks out in the gold and silver space, because even though there are so many and so many good ones, you never know in this space. You know, the kind of black swan that's going to happen to one of these guys for whatever reason. And I think that's why Don's such a collector. He he spreads out his picks over so many picks because it is kind of volatile, not only in terms of price, but in the day to day news. Go ahead. No. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to add to the sandstorm issue. I don't know if you guys were. I guess you guys weren't in the loop. They had an 80 million uh, placement, I think, at uh, something a little over five dollars a share. Uh, there's a guy. I uh, what's his name? I don't. I don't know if you guys follow him. Is, is it Ken something? Ken, God damn it! Why is in my Twitter search working? Oh, this Ben. Oh, there we go. Ben Kramer Miller. I don't know if you guys follow him. The Wealth Miner. Do you guys follow that guy? Uh, unfamiliar. I haven't <clears throat> heard of him. Yeah, he. He, um, he. He seems to be more of a. He's in the mining space, but from all of his tweets in general, he just seems to be very negative about everything. But he, he mentioned about Sandstorm when that happened. I think he was the only one that I followed that mentioned it. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, the CEO did a bot uh, placement deal for like 80 million for Sandstorm at the low price of uh, $5 and 10 cents, I think. Um, as opposed to, he was bragging about buying back shares when it was $9 Sandstorm. Um, I don't really follow Sandstorm. I don't own Sandstorm purely because they, one of their mines is in Turkey. Uh, I don't think that's going to go out uh, go over so well in the future. But um, in general, if you guys don't follow him, he, he is a good follow, but he's he's more of a, a skeptic, a pessimist, I, I would say, in the mining uh, space. Just just to give you guys a heads, heads up. The ad is the wealth miner, at the wealth miner. Thank you for that, man. Thank you. Well, hopefully, Alex, you'll get uh, a nice, you know, uh, rising tide lifts all boats arena soon, and maybe you can uh, get out of break even and roll into something else. Um, it is trying to round out and turn up here in the last three days, so uh, that could happen for sure. But um, uh, if anything, anyone has anything else for you, feel free to uh, request to speak. Uh, otherwise, we were talking about cutting this one short. Um just to kind of have an early Saturday. We do this every Saturday. So, uh, you know, there's a lot going on in the markets. Obviously, go ahead. Nostra. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask, I don't know if Jim's still here, but what were his thoughts uh, a couple weeks back on the uh, short interest in SLB? I know there's a lot of fanfare, but I didn't see any of the spaces discuss it. Yeah, Nostra, um, I don't have a license to talk about stocks. So um, I'm not a, a proponent of SLV, but uh, I'm a futures broker, not a stock broker. So I'd rather not really uh, make any comment at all on SLV, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I, if other people know about it, it was the short interest in uh, SLV that a lot of the silver people were, were pushing that it was all time high. It was above 7%, which I did get into, but their ideas of what was going on was a little far-fetched to me 
they they were under the impression that the <clears throat> banks were borrowing uh, they were borrowing uh, shares to redeem it. Um, there's a lot of talk about it. I, it's just shame that there's no spaces to actually go in depth about what was actually going on. I don't know if Jim could um, comment. I know he doesn't want to talk about stocks, but if you could comment, if you're a bullion bank and you're short silver futures, you can offset the short by going long SLV in your hedge book. That would equal out. Is that not correct, Jim? No, sir. That's not how it works. First of all, if a bullion bank is short futures, they can maybe they can have a substitute offset with SLV, but futures can only be offset uh, like a couple ways. One is to cover your short. If you're the bullion bank, basically, let's say you sold one contract of December gold. You can offset that by buying one contract of December gold. Or you can deliver in delivery period, which will start the last business day of November. You can deliver one 100 ounce bar to the speculator or the fund or the investor or the trader that is long into delivery. So you, they may have some sort of, uh, to answer your question, they may have some sort of internal trade or pair trade that they're doing with, you know, their, in their own trading account, but a futures account doesn't trade SLV. Right. I'm aware of that. But I, from what I know is um, uh, if you are short the, the futures, you could actually deliver SLV shares to, to meet your obligation, obligation. That's what Bob Coleman has said multiple times. No, it, that's not how it works on the uh, COMEX. If you're short futures and you want to deliver, you have to deliver one 100 ounce bar for gold. In SLV, if you're talking, you have to deliver five 1,000 ounce bars. OK, now the SLV par authorized participants, you know, this is more than I want to you know, mention, but th there's a few authorized par participants. It's not the general public, but it's typically large banks. They can redeem shares for uh, silver or they can redeem silver for shares. They can do that. And uh, they might be able to get their bars. Right, that Jim. Way. Jim, I'm aware of that. It's just the you're familiar with Bob Coleman. He's talked about the exchange for uh, for related positions, the EFR. He's mentioned before. I haven't looked into this myself, so I'm not sure if, he's, if it's correct. But he said you could deliver actual shares, not the metal, actual shares of SLV to to meet your uh, short position. It, That's it, not true. That is not correct. And actually, the acronym is EFP, not EFR, but it's EFP. But that is incorrect. On the COMEX exchange, you cannot deliver anything, any shares. The only thing you can deliver is metal. Now, once again, that bullion bank, that authorized, if they're an authorized participant of SLV, they can obtain the metal and deliver that metal on the futures exchange. If that's what you're kind of going around the circle. Around <clears throat> right, the right. No, no, I'm not talking about exchange for physical where you take delivery at like the LBMA. I'm talking about exchange for uh, for risk uh, where you do a, like an OTC uh, um, swap kind of a thing. Because if you look at, if you go to the COMEX uh, website, the cmegroup.com and you look at the silver or the gold futures, um, <clears throat> there is... Uh, for the trade type details, they do have e, uh, uh, EFP, EFR, EFS, and TAS. So that, that's what he was talking about, the EFR, the exchange for risk, where you could deliver actual shares of SLV, which was a surprise to me. I've never heard of it before. Yeah. But Bob Coleman is a reputable person, so I just took No, he's – Bob's good. Bob's good. But the, the long on the COMEX exchange, the long doesn't want anything if in delivery, doesn't want anything but the metal. He's going to trade his dollars – for metal. And uh, I'm not quite sure what Bob is talking about. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that, where, where the long wants the metal. But from what I understand from reading the actual uh, COMEX uh, literature, it's the it's the short that decides when to deliver or if to deliver at all, because they could just buy back the, the position, it, it, even at the last second, if, if they so wish. Those are how you're, the rules are set up. You're exactly right. And the long can get out of their position before they get delivered on. You're right on that in, in that respect. But in the delivery period, the assumption can be made that the long wants the metal and the short has the metal to deliver. But you're correct in that the short decides the day that, that it takes place because the short is long the metal. That's in, in delivery. 
okay? The bullion bank, if it is, it might be you. You might be long the metal uh, from, you know, uh, let's say we're at $30 silver and you bought and took delivery of, at $20 silver. So you've got a $10 profit in it. You call your futures broker and you say, all right, I want to deliver. I want to take my profit. So you instruct your futures broker to, to go short one contract. You're long the metal in your in the warehouse. You've got it. You've got title to it. And you can uh, constitute delivery of that by being long the metal with a short futures to deliver that metal. As long as it's COMEX approved warehouse and COMEX approved silver. And for silver, it's five 1,000 ounce bars. Right. Have you gone through the delivery process with COMEX ever before, Jim? Not. I've had one, one customer that was interested in it, but it's my opinion that my clients shouldn't take delivery. And the reason is they're parting with cash and then they're 100% funded. Okay. They can trade, they can just exit out of the futures. And the futures margin right now is $8,250 at our futures commission merchant. You can trade for that $100,000, 5,000 ounces times $20. You can trade eight contracts if you want to, or six contracts or five contracts. So it, we trade futures contracts for the leverage because the leverage gives you an accelerated return on your investment. So I don't want my customers taking delivery. Now, one thing that would change would, would be if you were an electric vehicle manufacturer or you were a solar panel customer and you wanted to hedge the uh, price of silver, right now it's cheap, it's $19. I would say, okay, let's buy a contract or two contracts or however many contracts you need for the next three months, six months, you know, up to a year. And then we'll just go along those futures Maybe uh, some in December, some in uh, February, some in uh, next, you know, August. And then we would take a delivery of one contract of silver or two contracts of silver, whatever your co company needed. Then it's okay to take delivery. But I don't really want my customers taking delivery because they're going from a leveraged investment, a high octane kind of a race car approach to a very slow approach of being, you know, having your silver, having your asset 100% paid for. The leverage is very, very good in futures. That's why I'm a futures broker to, you know, consult with my clients and, uh, you know, make sure that they get the, the return on investment that they're looking for. Jim, how are the, uh, the option on the futures? Is there a lot of um, uh, activity for, for your firm? The, uh, if you want to, I can address that with by talking about open interest, if you know about that. Open interest in both. Gold <clears throat> and silver is down sharply from uh, what it has been in the past. And the margins have come down in both, in gold and silver. So it's not a function of margin at this time. I think what it is, is that uh, traders seem to get more excited in silver over 25 or 28, certainly over $30. When we trade over 28 or $30, I think the open interest in silver it's like 130,000 contracts, total open interest right now, like 127, 129, something like that, real close to that. And I would expect that that to go back over 200,000, 220,000 uh, in silver. Gold is about three times that. Gold is under 500,000 open interest now. It's like 440, something like that, 440,000. So both are off sharply. I'm hoping I'm answering your question. The options are... Uh, uh, just a, a fraction of what the futures open interest is. Right. And just one last question, Jim. I, I don't know if you, uh, do you remember when was the last time COMEX decreased the margin requirement for gold and silver? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, they decreased the margin in uh, gold uh, three times, two times in the last two weeks. Okay. But before silver. that, was it April or May? Yeah, it's, it's a function of, of volatility and uh, sh in short periods of time. But the, uh, I'll just give you an example. The margin on silver at our Futures Commission merchant was over, call it $15,000 a few months back. And now it's half that. It's eighty two fifty. dollars Gold, uh, the margin was, I think, 12000 And the margin has come down from 8000 to 7000 And now it's, I looked the, yesterday, uh, Friday, and it's uh, 6200 uh, I think it's $6,200. So gold has had their uh, margin deposit decreased twice in the last two weeks and silver once in the last two or three months. Right. The reason I bring that up is um, I, I think it was in April or May. I don't really remember the date. But what was odd to me was uh, gold and silver were up uh, significantly 
and uh, the, the the Comex or the the, the brokerages de- decrease the margin requirement, which I thought was very odd because they never do that. It's usually the opposite. If they move yeah. up, they increase increase. Do you remember what date that was? I first of all, just to correct you, the brokerages only increase or decrease the margin that is set by the exchange. The brokerages can set their own uh, margin, but they have to at least maintain exchange minimums for and just so everybody in the room is is understanding the exchange requires both the short and the long of that one futures contract to post margin because margin is how the winning side gets paid from the losing side at the end of every trading day the funds go from the losing side to the winner side at the end of every trading day so when you go to sleep at night when you wake up in the morning if you made five hundred dollars on one contract that's 10 cents in silver. If you made 10 cents, $500, that $500 will be in, in your account in the morning, in your futures account, and it came from the losing side. If you were long and it went up 10 cents, the short that is your counterparty on that contract, his margin deposit paid your account that 10 cents or $500. It's $50 a penny in uh, silver, and it's $100 per dollar in gold. That's how the... Uh, um, contracts work. Gold is a hundred ounce contract, so it's a hundred dollars for every dollar it moves. Silver is a five thousand ounce contract, so five thousand ounces times each times oh one times each penny is fifty dollars a penny. And that once again, it changes. It it moves from the losing side to the winning side at the end of every trading day. Right. I, I only bring that up because when it happened, when it occurred, I had never seen it before where the metals move up and the margin goes down. So when that happened, uh, I was very suspicious. The alarm bells in my head kind of rang. I just and then afterwards, uh, the metal was smashed. So, yeah, it's just the, uh, very odd. The margin gets changed due to increases in volatility over short periods of time. The uh I guess the one uh, interesting date to talk about is uh, the beginning of February of uh, 2020, a year and a half ago, that uh, 2021, I think it was, a year and a half ago, that uh, the silver squeeze movement came in and silver was trading around $27. They had, uh, they got a bunch of people, a bunch of their followers, and a bunch of them I'm talking about, not a thousand, multiples, many multiples of a thousand. Uh, people went in and started buying silver up and the price moved in that week in those four or five days, four or five trading days, it went up $3 and down $3. So both sides, both the longs and the shorts uh, ended up on margin call at the end of that, during that week of that $3 up move and that $3 down move. You add them together. It's a $6 move in silver. It's uh, $6 times $5,000 a dollar. It's a $30,000 move. And, uh, Margins can't be, you can't have a, you know, a a $15,000 move in silver in two or three days with a $6,000 margin. It doesn't work that way. So they had to increase the margins both, first of all, on the shorts and then on the longs in that uh, particular week of February 2021. Right. So it's all interesting. Um, um, Jim, just for the, just, just to be clear, are you on the, uh, the, uh, the camp of it's manipulated or are you in, in the other camp that it's not? I'm of the, here's my definition, first of all, and then I'll tell you where my, what my opinion is. Manipulation, classic manipulation is if a company or an individual or a group of companies or individuals causes a change in price and benefits from that change in price, that's manipulation. That's the classic definition. They cause a change and they benefit from the change. And I am of the opinion that that has happened both upside and downside. I firmly believe that the price of metals have have been manipulated, silver more than gold. Silver is a little easier, but it has been. That's my opinion to answer your question. Okay, thanks, Jim. All right. Good stuff. Uh, does anybody have anything else that they want to talk about, ask about, bring up, bring to anyone's attention, anything at all? If I can just um, maybe address the movement that I see coming again, uh, let's say silver is $19. 
And I, I mentioned earlier in the room to watch for $20, then 21, then 23. Well, from 19 to 23, that's a $4 move in silver. So all the silver you've got in your closet or your safe or your safety deposit box is going to go up $4 an ounce. Well, one futures contract is 5,000 ounces. A $4 move is 20 grand. Okay. I already, I just mentioned the margin is 82.50. That 20 grand is almost a 300%, it's, call it 200% move on uh four dollar move in uh with futures that's why futures are they're the hot rod investment and people you know talk about options being you know kind of a hot rod as well but that's why futures aren't for everybody because of the leverage use and it can also go against you and just to make everybody in the room aware the longs have been losing since uh, march or april of this year the shorts have been winning everybody that took delivery Everybody that's bought silver since March or April, they're all underwater. But I don't think that that's a long-term uh, price level that we're going to maintain. Silver is $19 for December futures. And as I say, I said, watch 20, 21, then 23. And then after that, we can talk, you know, in, uh, in a few weeks on a Saturday evening in your uh, spaces, Liberty. Uh, we'll be, you know, I'll have different price targets after we get through 23. Very good. Well, I will offer one more last call here. Otherwise, uh, my son caught some fresh fish and it's waiting on me uh, at the dinner table. So uh, anybody got anything else? I'd like to ask one more thing. You said your son caught fish. Um, I believe you might be in one of the southern states. Can I ask, was your son bass fishing? He wasn't specifically bass fishing, no, uh, but he catches bass on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, so he's got several. Yeah, go ahead. I believe in uh, your area, I, I guess I'm familiar with, a little familiar with where you're at. In your state, there are some big, big bass uh, swimming around for your son to catch. Thanks. Yes, sir. There are some big catfish, too. We used to run trot lines when I was a little boy with my papa. And so we'd go out, you know, five, six in the morning. We'd be on the water before the sun had even come up. We'd get to the trot line. The sun would just be coming up. And uh, we'd pull out, you know, 45, 65-pound catfish that were as long as I was tall when I was six years old. So that was pretty cool, too. <laughs> and we'd catch – we'd sit at the dock and catch perch. And, you know, we, we caught it all. So, yeah, I grew up fishing. So good stuff. Could well, I – could on your on your behalf, Liberty, could I just invite everybody that's listening tonight in the room to come back next Saturday? Would that be all right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of talk about after this week. So <laughs> we'll get down to everything. Uh, but uh, everyone, enjoy the rest of your Saturday night. Thanks for coming in. And we'll see you at the same time next Saturday, 7 p.m. Central. Take care, guys.